You're listening to the Bloomberg Opinion Podcast. Catch us Saturdays at 1 and 7 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Bloomberg Opinion. I'm Amy Morris. This week, we look at Buy American, not just a slogan, but a rule. And there is concern now that that rule will make America less safe. We've heard all about targeted cancer drugs for years, but now it looks like they're finally starting to show results that are more substantial than just the hype. And we'll look at a call for the FDA to get to the root of hair straighteners. But first, we begin with climate change and the debate over the science of climate change. Science provides a framework for understanding the world, but deciding how to shape policy based on that guidance can be a matter of interpretation. During climate negotiations at the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Dubai, a controversial statement from Sultan Al Jaber, the oil executive who led the COP28 climate summit in Dubai, has resurfaced about the limitations of science. And there is no science uh, out there or no scenario out there that says that the phase out of fossil fuel is what's going to achieve 1.5. 1.5 is my North Star. And a phase down and a phase out of fossil fuel, in my view, is inevitable. He defended his comments, saying they'd been misinterpreted. I have said over and over that the phase down and the phase out of fossil fuel is inevitable. I honestly think that there is some confusion out there and misrepresentation and misinterpretation. Let's turn now to Bloomberg Opinion columnist Lara Williams. She covers climate change and she attended COP28. She can shine some light on all of this for us. Lara, Al Jaber's comments are not wrong. They are true. So how much room for interpretation is there really? There every every ton of carbon we put into the atmosphere, I guess there's there's less and less room for interpretation as, you know, our carbon budget for keeping warming temperatures under one point five degrees uh is is being reduced um every day. But the IPCC, so that is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they review all the science that's out there. And they come up with a report that determines based on, you know, strong, strong certainty, medium certainty, low certainty. They, it basically sums up every, all the studies and science out there on climate change. And they have a number of pathways uh, and scenarios compatible with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. And so some of them uh, like rely on what would happen if we switch to renewables? What would happen if we relied more heavily on energy efficiency measures? What would happen if we rely on carbon capture technology? So the way that, it, you know, it's it's presented in IPCC reports does leave room for interpretation, um, which I guess, you know, people can, you know, choose their, their pathway based on uh, what, what what kind of priorities they have, how confident they are in technology uh, and the economics. Um, but having said that, all scenarios compatible with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures, which is ideally what we want to do, does involve greatly reducing fossil fuel use to a fraction of what it is today. And that's basically the point behind your column, which is that the science is debatable but inescapable, which is how you put it in your column. You know, so often, if the science is proven correct, it's the fact. There's not a lot of wiggle room. That's what it is, black and white. But that doesn't always seem to be the case when it comes to climate change, as you just illustrated, because there are so many different paths to get to the actual answer. Is that why this is so hard? Because we're in uncharted territory and there's so much debate about how to get from point A to point B? I think so. I think, you know, and obviously you've got to remember that everybody has their own entrenched interests. And so renewables are really cheap. And so they're a really good way to reduce fossil fuels, which is ultimately what we need to do and therefore stop global warming. But, you know, some people make a lot of money out of fossil fuels. And so they're obviously going to want to push a different agenda. Um, And then some countries you know, renewables aren't so cheap because the cost of capital is more expensive. So developing nations might feel that even though 
you know, they recognize that we shouldn't, we need to phase out fossil fossil fuels as, as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, developed nations like the UK and the US have um, kind of really had the kind of former advantage and being able to develop by using fossil fuels and therefore it might not be so fair for for them not to be able to do that um so it becomes i guess a little bit more more complicated when you're thinking about uh enabling the continuation of sustainable development what was your takeaway when you heard the controversial statement from sultan al jaber i well i think that actually you know he's not technically wrong um not technically wrong, uh, as Jim Steer, the head of the IPCC, points out, but it's missing that crucial context, which is uh, the we there's no room for expansion of fossil fuels, which is what um, ADNOT, which is the Abu Dhabi national oil company, which uh, Al Jaber is the oil is the CEO of the oil. It's an oil company. They want to pump more oil by 2027, and you know, so his comments, while technically true, kind of miss out that that context, which is there's there's no room for expansion. We're gonna we we barely need any fossil fuels by 2050 and 2100 if we you know follow a a pathway compatible with 1.5, and so he was kind of missing out some key facts. I also wondered if he also intended to include that they'd have to do more than just limit fossil fuels. It sort of almost sounded like there's no pathway for these fossil fuel limitations to get us to that goal because it won't be enough. You you know what I mean? Like it seemed like he was calling for to do more than just focus on fossil fuels. Yes, and that is that is a good point. Uh, we do need to do more than just limit fossil fuels because the way we use our lands, the way we grow our food also contributes to global warming. And so that there needs to be a lot more action. And if we um, aren't going to phase out fossil fuels entirely, then we're going to have to ramp up car- carbon capture technology, carbon removal technology. Um, and so th- there's, there is a lot of work to be done beyond just twisting the use of fossil fuels. We are talking with Bloomberg Opinion columnist Lara Williams about the science of climate change and if there's any room for interpretation. Laura, one of the uh, points you make in your column on the Bloomberg Terminal is that the future role of fossil fuels is one of the most controversial issues that countries are grappling with at the climate summit. Some have been pushing for a phase out. Others are calling for a weaker language of a phase down. Why is all of this so very hard to nail down? Well, because everybody has their different um, priorities, and the I guess the the problem with the with the top process is that everything has to be made by consensus, which means all the parties of the United Nations have to agree, and um, it's incredibly difficult to just you know pick something and stick to it when there are different um, you know. They're at different levels of readiness. They have different uh, economic abilities. Um, they have, you know, they make their money in different ways. It'll, it's, you know, it'd be much easier for the UK now to switch entirely to renewables. Uh, we're aiming to do it by 2035 than it is for, um, you know, a potentially a poorer country, which doesn't have that capacity yet. Um, and so that makes it difficult. And then, you know, you also have those entrenched interests in, in some countries, like, for example, Saudi Arabia, which will block, you know, the use of quite definitive language. Uh, they want to leave as many options on the table as possible. Um, and so that's what makes it hard to just, you know, put a fossil fuel phase out on the table. That There's always going to be, or there has historically always been you know, some holdouts and and people who don't want that to happen because they make a lot of money out of fossil fuels. It would mean completely changing the way that they make their money and run their economy. And they are, I guess, understandably extremely hesitant, even though I say understandably in a way that I don't I don't agree with it, uh, obviously. Well, you attended COP28. You were there. Did anything at the conference stand out for you or surprise you? Well, I think... Um, I was surprised. It, it's a it's a it's a very exciting place to be. There's a there's a buzz. You you know everybody from all over the world. You know every country is 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 represented at COP28, 
which was quite exciting. I found it interesting, you know, so you have every, lots of nations and NGOs have their pavilions where they, you know, hold events and, you know, highlight the kind of things that they're doing in their country or their group to, um, you know, on climate action. And I found interesting is in one building, you know, you go in on the ground floor and uh, OPEC, has their pavilion and you walk up two flights of stairs and just above the OPEC pavilion is the indigenous people's pavilion calling out, you know, for a complete phase out of fossil fuels. And so that was a really interesting kind of juxtaposition of, you know, all, all views were represented at COP. Laura, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Laura Williams is a Bloomberg Opinion columnist who covers climate change. Now, coming up, we'll look at the Buy American rules, especially when it comes to the military and how some believe that could make the U.S. less safe. You're listening to Bloomberg Opinion. You're listening to the Bloomberg Opinion podcast. Catch us Saturdays at 1 and 7 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Bloomberg Opinion. I'm Amy Morris. A little more than a year ago, President Biden laid out his economic vision for America, including a Buy American provision to help invest in existing jobs, add more jobs, and secure the supply chain. We're going to invest in America again. We're going to make it in America again. And the federal government's going to buy America. That's been my economic vision. The Buy American rules have long applied to the military's purchase of things like food and clothes and construction supplies. But now weapons manufacturers have some wide discretion to use materials from outside the U.S. if they have to, if doing so is necessary for the country's defense. Well, now Congress is taking steps to rein all of that in. Bloomberg Opinion Editor Ramesh Ratnazar is joining me now to sort of help shed some light on what's going on here. First, Ramesh, thank you. And what does Buy American mean, really? Well, um, dating back to the Depression, uh, the federal government has been required to um, source uh, any goods that they purchase um, to uh, domestic sources. So um, at the moment, uh, 55% of anything, any goods that uh, the federal government buys uh, has to contain um, content made in the United States. Um, The Biden administration has, um, uh, since coming into office, tried to increase um, that threshold. So um, that number has now uh, been bumped up to 60 percent with an aim, uh, at least according to the executive order that the administration put out, um, of getting to 75 percent by 2029. Now, in your column, you say that the White House and the protectionist forces in Congress, which is your terminology, they're taking steps to make it harder for the U.S. to replenish its weapons stockpiles. Not that that's their intent, but that yeah. may be the end result. My first question is, how are the White House and protectionists on the same page at all? Well, you know, the impulse behind a lot of the sort of push to buy American um, is this. Uh, idea that um, what we've seen over the last several years is um, the vulnerability of the U.S. supply chain and the fact that uh, so many uh, materials that we need that are critical to our national security um, are made overseas. And because of that diffuse supply chain, uh, we are vulnerable to shocks like the pandemic, uh, but also potentially to, uh, you know, uh, military conflicts um, with uh, with other countries, most notably China. Um, the uh, so that's the kind of basis for this push. Um, the problem is that the military needs access to technology and draws on uh, technology from all over the world. And uh, the fact is that um, the military, just like many other uh, parts of our economy, um, has been using and uh, trading with partners all over the world um, to make um, its weapon systems. And um, a lot of weapon systems that the military uses have components um, that are made in other parts of the world. And 
by increasing the threshold that the military has to meet um, when they buy these weapons, uh, you're going to actually make it harder for and more costly for the military to replenish its supplies when they run low, as they are running low right now. If you are uh, telling the military you can no longer uh, use a supplier that you have an arrangement with, that you have a contract with, that you've negotiated a uh, a lower price with, I mean, it, or a defense contractor, um, those uh, companies are then going to have to find uh, new suppliers. Um, maybe they're based in the U.S., but the costs of doing that are going to be higher. Um, and the other factor that people don't take into account is a lot of the best stuff does come from overseas. Uh, the United States, in many cases, doesn't manufacture um, the best components for certain weapon systems, and the military wa- has a reason to use uh, components that are made overseas because they're better for um, uh, they better protect the country's security. So, setting these uh, uh, requirements, while well intended, um, could have um, these consequences that could be actually quite negative for, for national security. And we are talking with Bloomberg Opinion Editor Romesh Rednasar about the downside of Buy American. Remember when we were kids, the idea of Buy American became just really entrenched. How did it get so entrenched and how did it turn on us? Well, I think that um, there still are good reasons to buy American. There still are good reasons to try to find ways to um, make as much uh, as we can domestically. I think that is, in the long run, um, the the way you can insulate yourself from unexpected supply chain shocks and disruptions. Uh, I think the point is that if you talk to people uh, both in the Pentagon and also in the defense industry, um, they would say, we're faced with an extraordinary challenge right now. We are trying to supply arms to uh, uh, Ukraine, now to Israel, while also um, dealing with the potential for um, uh, escalating tensions with uh, China and trying to uh, make sure that Taiwan is adequately defended. Um, There simply aren't enough resources domestically right now to meet those needs. And if you've basically tie the Pentagon's hands behind their back, uh, you are going to make it harder, more expensive, uh, and less likely that they can actually um, meet those national security needs and protect the country's security. What message does it send when those protectionist messages are tacked into the defense budget? Well, one of the biggest problems is the message it sends to our allies. I mean, one of the things that um, the military and the Pentagon has been trying to do is encourage and build more partnerships with allies, encourage allies to take on a bigger role in defense production, knowing that we can't do it all ourselves. Uh, By um, imposing these kinds of rules, you're sort of discouraging allies from cooperating in the same way. And you could lead to some of our some countries we partner with very closely uh, erecting their own restrictions on um, the uh, the weapons that we produce um, and that's a, again be counterproductive you're going to hurt American industry you're going to cost Americans jobs if that happens so um, the message it sends is uh, we're trying to protect our industries uh, you're going to encourage other countries to protect theirs um, and and that's incompatible with a really coordinated multilateral defense strategy. Where does this go from here at this point? What's going to happen next? And is there any way to resolve it? Well, I think what you're going to see is more pressure for more explicit exceptions to this rule for our close allies and partners. So um, we have um, arrangements, trading arrangements with um, a number of our NATO allies that basically allow the Pentagon to do business with them and trade with them without being um, affected by these rules. But there are a lot of NATO allies that don't have those arrangements. And then we have a lot of partners, uh, especially in Asia, who don't have those arrangements. So more exemptions for those countries, I think, might be one way to mitigate the uh, the potential damage. Um, and then I think more investment in building up that defense industrial base in the U.S., even if 
in the short term, this is a bad idea. In the long run, we do want to have and produce more of uh, the uh, the weapons we need in here in the United States. Um, and there are steps that can be taken to upgrade the workforce here, to encourage um, um, better contracting, better procurement practices. Um, those are the kinds of things that need to be done in the long run to build that defense industrial base here at home. Ramesh Ratnazar is a Bloomberg Opinion editor. And coming up, the science surrounding targeted cancer drugs. It's giving more people some hope. Don't forget we're available as a podcast on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. This is Bloomberg Opinion. You're listening to the Bloomberg Opinion Podcast. Catch us Saturdays at 1 and 7 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Bloomberg Opinion. I'm Amy Morris. And after decades of fits and starts, the science around designing and testing targeted cancer drugs has finally coalesced. And this class of drugs is now having its moment. The field has gone through waves of hype and investment over the past few decades, but now it's starting to look like the hype may be more than just hype. Let's bring in Bloomberg Opinion columnist Lisa Jarvis. She covers biotech, healthcare, and the pharmaceutical industry, and she's going to bring us up to speed on this. First of all, Lisa, what is a targeted cancer drug? Right. So the class of drugs we're talking about is called antibody drug conjugates. That's a wonky term, but basically the antibody part of the drug is going straight to a protein that's on a tumor cell and tacked onto the antibody is chemotherapy. I say tacked on as if that's like it was just thrown on there, but actually it's taken a lot of work to attach it to the antibody in just the right way so that this very powerful chemotherapy doesn't release until it hits the cancer cell. So that means that the side effects should be a lot more mild than when you just, like you couldn't give this type of chemotherapy just on its own. Um, You need that antibody to bring it straight to the tumor. And so um, people have been working on this for quite literally decades, like 40 years, trying to get this uh, technology right. And we're starting to see a host of just really impressive data that these drugs can work um, Um, in a broader range of cancers than I think people anticipated in the past. So what made the difference? What is new with these drugs that they are finally starting to live up to, as you say, the hype? I think it took a lot of tinkering on all parts of the actual molecule, um, picking the right antibody, but really that linker was important because if it releases too early, it could have toxic side effects. And then I think clinical data, they're starting to understand where to use these drugs. And we had a trial that came out or that read out last year um, in 2022 in breast cancer. That was just a really big turning point for the field because basically it was the drug that targeted a protein called HER2 that's on the surface of a lot of breast cancers. Um, But what they found was not only did that drug help people live longer, but it also... um, you didn't need to have as much HER2 around that they previously thought. So that kind of opens the door to using this in a lot more kinds of cancer. Why is targeted therapy in and of itself so significant, so important? I understand that it's lessens the, the, it lessens the side effects, but does it make it more effective? Well, one of the things they're also learning and that has also changed the field is that, um, you know, they have these bystander effects. So when you, if you just gave this, there's drugs that target just HER2 on their own. Those are classic cancer drugs. They can only kill cancer cells that have HER2 on the surface. And this type of drug, the Once the chemo is released, um, it can actually kill a few different cells. And so there's having this bystander effect that turns out to be really important and powerful um, and is increasingly something they're designing into the drug. And so I think that's kind of where the future is going with this class of drugs is understanding how to get them to kill not just the one cell that it targeted, but some of its neighbors that may not have that protein on the surface, Um, which is important because not all tumor cells are alike. We think of them as a like, but our tumors are actually heterogeneous and have lots of different things going on there. And we are talking with Bloomberg Opinion columnist Lisa Jarvis about targeted cancer drug therapy and how it is finally starting to live up to the hype and, and the work that's been put into this for decades. 
Lisa, let's shift to the business sector then. What are you seeing in the business sector that gives you more of a sense that there really is something here now? Well, we've seen three big deals this year. I mean, two of them quite big. Um, one was obviously um, in the spring, we saw Pfizer buy CGen for $43 billion. That was a huge acquisition and CGen had been pursued by other companies. Um, we then just recently saw AbbVie acquire Immunogen for $10.1 million, billion, dollars, sorry. <laughs> that company was really like the original, those are the two original companies that have been working on this technology. But we've seen smaller deals that are still significant. Merck paid $4 billion up front to do a deal not to acquire, but to just um, get access to a few drugs from Daiichi Sankyo. And then we've seen other companies doing collections of little deals like Bristol Myers Squibb and Lilly. Um, just it feels like the technology has matured to a point where people finally really believe that it's going to be a staple in cancer care. Why was it so hard to get here? It's funny, a lot of the companies that I just mentioned as buying other people had been working in this field years ago and they all got out of it. I think that it just, it it sounds so simple to say like, tack a chemo onto the antibody. That actually was very difficult to do. Um, that piece, getting it right, was just the science behind it and the, the chemistry was very tough. And it's just finally reached a point where they understand how to make these drugs, how to manufacture them. And now um, it's going to be more about um, exploring biology and seeing how they can design better ones to work in many more kinds of cancer. Is targeted cancer therapy like what we're describing here? Is it in common use yet? Is it considered standard of care yet? I think it's getting there. And, and there's a number of these drugs that are on the market. Um, but uh, the really important one, as I mentioned, there was this data that came out last year in a drug called inher 2 That drug is developed by AstraZeneca and Daiichi Sankyo in um, HER2 positive breast cancer. But again, could also be in people who very little HER2 on their tumors. Um, and so right now it's in metastatic cancer. I mean, I think there's an idea that this could be moving earlier and earlier eventually. When I talked to oncologists, when this really impressive data came out last year, some of them felt like it could replace chemo in some, you know, types of cancer, which would be a big deal. I mean, it's, I'll say it's more expensive than chemo, but, you know, I think it's also potentially more effective and, um, you know, maybe a little easier on patients. Where are insurance companies on this? Have they bought in or is that jury still out? Yeah, I think they've bought in. Um, certainly, I think, you know, we're seeing um, increasingly, for example, another drug, Immunogen, the company that was proposed acquisition by AbbVie, has a drug called Elahir that was app uh, approved last year for ovarian cancer. And that was really considered the first advance for ovarian cancer patients um, in a long time. Another thing that I think companies find attractive about this is they're very hard to mimic. It's going to be hard for generic companies to swoop in when the patents expire and make their own versions of these. So, um, you know, they probably are going to be in companies' portfolios for a really long time. When you describe the targeted cancer therapy, I get this image because I am a simple woman. I get this image of like a little heat-seeking missile painted on the end with the targeted therapy, and it goes into the system and it aims for that cancer cell and poof, it's almost cartoon-like in my head because I have to oversimplify it to understand it. When they are able to create a technology that can do something like that, you had mentioned replacing chemo altogether. How far away would that be? You know, I think we need more data. You know, I think it's, you know, kind of a clinical story with some of these drugs is trying to show that they can work in other kinds of cancer. Um, but I think one of the things that's really exciting um, is that this discovery, and I again, I know it sounds so wonky, but that people with very low levels of this protein on the surface of their tumors respond to these drugs, that could open up the um, landscape of other types of antibodies that people use that may have been sitting on a shelf because they thought, oh, these aren't going to be the heat seeking missile we anticipated. And so um, I think, you know, we're going to see a broader um, landscape of drugs developed. And then we'll just have to see how it plays out in the clinic. But, you know, I think in the next few years, these are going to become even bigger drugs. They're already, some of them, are, a few of them, a handful are already pretty good drugs um, in, in doing pretty well. But I think we're going to see more of that. Are they also going to have to do the same sorts of uh, standard of care after, that they would normally have to do after chemo? Like when you have chemotherapy, your white blood cell count is low. Um, is that less of a risk with this new targeted therapy? 
So, you know, it's funny because we talk about these as being heat seeking vessels, but they do sometimes come apart in your bloodstream. So they're not free of side effects. I think part of the attractiveness of them is that you can attach such a powerful chemotherapy to them um, that you wouldn't be able to give, you know, kind of on their on its own. Um, And so it's really, really good at cancer killing. So the side effects are not benign, but they're pretty good and they're getting under really good at understanding how to manage those and how to predict what they see in animal studies, for example, how that will translate into humans. So this is tremendous. Thank you so much for following this for us. We're going to continue to follow it with you, Lisa, as they make more developments. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Amy. Lisa Jarvis is a Bloomberg Opinion columnist who covers biotech, healthcare, and the pharmaceutical industry. Don't forget we're available as a podcast on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. This is Bloomberg Opinion. Let's talk hair. Hair straighteners, specifically. The Food and Drug Administration announced this fall that several common treatments to smooth, straighten, or relax hair contain known carcinogens like formaldehyde. Let's learn more from F.D. Flam, a Bloomberg Opinion columnist covering science and host of the Follow the Science podcast. Faye, welcome. Formaldehyde? How dangerous is this? Well, you know, the dose makes the poison, and we get exposed to formaldehyde all the time in tiny amounts. But the concern is that there's actually a lot of formaldehyde in some of the hair treatments that are being used in salons right now. I talked to a a young female chemist who said she had one of these treatments. She'd saved up for it. She didn't really know what was in it. And then she smelled the distinct smell of formaldehyde while she was in the chair. And that got her to really look into it. So you can get formaldehyde-free products for your hair, but you explain they include something called glycolic acid, it's not much better. Well, it actually is a precursor to formaldehyde. So when it's treated, it can become formaldehyde. And so there there are a lot of salon treatments that are apparently marketed as formaldehyde free to the salons, but they, they actually create the same hazard because the formaldehyde is formed during the heating, which is usually part of the process. Usually they will use hot dryers and they'll, uh, and they'll, they'll straight iron your hair with a lot of heat. So the hazard is still there. There are other ones that don't use any formaldehyde or formaldehyde forming products. But most of us don't know the ingredients or wouldn't ask what the ingredients are in a salon treatment. We go to the salon and just assume that it's reasonably safe. Exactly. That's what I was going to ask about. How solid is this data? How do they know that what we've been putting in or on our hair for decades might actually be this harmful? Well, there are two things that are going on. First, formaldehyde is a known carcinogen, you know, in a high enough dose. And there actually have been uh, OSHA studies where they monitored the amount of formaldehyde that was getting in the air in salons and found that it was above standards that should keep workers safe. So at least for the workers, there could definitely be a hazard. But the other thing was there was a big epidemiological study that came out about a year ago, and it showed that women who used hair straighteners, relaxers, these different kinds of products, either at home or in a salon, had a much higher rate of uterine cancer, which is sometimes associated with endocrine disrupting chemicals. It was as much as three times as as high as the women who didn't get these. But the weird thing about that was they can't really distinguish between the different kinds of products and whether it's the ones with formaldehyde or a whole other class that's used more often by Black women. They use it on a regular basis sometimes. And these have lye or something that's very irritating the scalp and also some uh, potentially endocrine disrupting chemicals. And so that combination could also be a possible mechanism for uh, being carcinogenic. So where is the FDA in all of this? Well, I think they're probably trying to figure out what they should control and what they should ban because this new study was kind of a surprise. I think they thought, oh, it's just the formaldehyde. That's the big problem. But this study suggests maybe this other type of treatment might actually be more of a danger to the the customers, the consumers. And a lot of salons are phasing those out now because um, it's very unpleasant to work with. The salon workers recognize that they're, uh, that the uh, hairdresser I go to said she'd done it a few times when 
the formaldehyde containing once first came out and she felt so sick afterwards and so did her colleagues in that salon that they stopped using it and got something else that was more expensive but um you know much nicer FD Flam is a Bloomberg Opinion columnist covering science and host of the Follow the Science podcast. And that does it for this week's Bloomberg Opinion. We are produced by Eric Molo, and you can find all of the columns on the Bloomberg Terminal. We are available as a podcast on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. Stay with us. Today's top stories and global business headlines are just ahead. I'm Amy Morris. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.